Well, before I begin, I'd like to thank the conference organizers. It's really a privilege to have the opportunity to speak to you today. We're very fortunate uh, to be able to work with uh, excellent collaborators, uh, Dr. Nadia Wahid at the New England Eye Center, uh, Christine Curcio at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, as well as uh, investigators at the Erlangen University uh, here in Germany. So the outline and take-home messages are uh, high-resolution uh, OCT, uh, which achieves less than three micron axial resolution, uh, can be used to quantify uh, fine structures in the outer retina, such as the RPE basal lamina Brooks membrane complex. These are potential markers for normal aging and the transition to early AMD. It's also possible to do volumetric imaging to assess focal pathologies. The example here would be hyperreflective features. I also wanted to speak about a uh, swept source, which can achieve extremely high imaging speeds. This can be used to do OCT and geography, variable scan time analysis, and it's possible to develop a surrogate marker, quantitative surrogate marker, which assesses capillary blood flow speeds. And this has applications to diabetic retinopathy. So uh, this shows an example of a prototype instrument. Uh, the specifications are essentially the same as the Heidelberg high-resolution uh, instrument, less than three micron axial resolution, uh, 128,000 axial scans per second. Uh, with this type of uh, speed and resolution, it's possible to do high-definition scanning. This is uh, covering a six by nine area of the macula. And then by displaying these images uh, using different scales, we see the conventional log scale uh, on the left side here, okay, um, versus a linear scale. The linear scale trades off dynamic range, uh, but it allows us to see features in the outer retina which would not normally be resolved with standard resolution. So we'll present a study here on normal aging and uh, early AMD. This is the enrollment, a uh, variety of normal subjects, uh, and then emphasis on early and intermediate AMD. In order to visualize and read these images, we flatten them to Brooks membrane, expand the vertical scale, and here you can see a normal young subject uh, where we can resolve uh, the separation uh, of uh, Brooks membrane from the RPE. You can see this across the entire uh, range of the image. And then as we go to older subjects, we start to lose this hyperreflective feature. Uh, and then finally, a uh, normal older subject. Uh, this hyperreflective feature is almost entirely not visible uh, throughout the scan. In contrast, if we look at early uh, AMD, uh, we see this feature again uh, across uh, the, the entire image here. Uh, so, and also uh, in intermediate AMD, the hyperreflective feature is continuous into the Drusen compartment. So um, we believe uh, that this uh, feature has two different origins. In younger subjects, uh, the hyperreflective band, uh, we believe it is due to the basal infoldings, which disintegrate uh, with normal aging. And then in older subjects, um, you can uh, see highlighted uh, in the uh, ultrastructure images. In older subjects, uh, we hypothesize that this is due to the basal laminar deposit. And uh, the presence of this deposit is the histological marker for AMD. So by uh, quantifying the visibility of this feature, in this case by human readers, uh, we can look across the different age groups and we see decreasing visibility uh, with normal aging, but an increase uh, in the appearance of the hyperreflective band in early and intermediate AMD subjects. We can use a combination of uh, human reading and quantitative uh, software to measure uh, the thickness of this feature. And I point out that this is on the micron scale here. Uh, so this is on the order of six microns uh, down to uh, two to four micron thicknesses. We see a decreasing uh, thickness with aging, but in uh, early AMD, uh, again, this feature appears and is thicker. Uh, so this is a, a potential marker, uh, we believe, uh, for AMD. The challenge then is to quantify this, and this can be uh, done by using AI techniques. 
uh, this is uh, very preliminary data uh, where uh, it's possible to map across the entire macula. These are uh, stratified according to age. Uh, the challenge here is that these are very fine features and also there's a transition between visibility and invisibility. Uh, so uh, I'd like to talk about the second application for uh, high resolution and high speed, uh, which is it's possible to do volumetric imaging. Uh, here we're using a software technique, but it's possible also to do eye tracking. Uh, this is collaboration with uh, FAU, Friedrich Alexander University. By taking two scans, it's possible to estimate the motion and correct it to render uh, motion corrected volume, which you see here. And it's possible also to average uh, data within the volumetric data set uh, to uh, increase uh, the visibility, similar to B-scan averaging, except this is done uh, volumetrically. So uh, with this type of uh, data set, we can track focal pathologies, uh, such as hyperreflective features. These are a known marker uh, for progression in AMD. And then uh, we can compare this uh, to uh, standard resolution, uh, high resolution on the top, standard resolution on the bottom. Uh, we can improve the visibility of uh, fine focal features. Okay, so by using software techniques, uh, it's possible to uh, detect and map uh, focal features uh, in volume. In this case, we're using optical attenuation uh, as the marker. And we can uh, false color these features according uh, to depth. Uh, so the uh, closeness to Brooks membrane versus inner plexiform layer is represented by the false color. And we can also render the uh, volumetric images uh, in standard methods. Uh, here we see elevation of Drusen um, and then a slice at the RPE plane. And then uh, also superimposed uh, on the hyperreflective uh, features. Okay, so uh, we can also display this uh, in a, a volumetric data set. Here's a limited scan, which we can then render from a virtual perspective. Uh, this shows uh, the Drusen as well as the relationship of the hyperreflective uh, foci uh, relative uh, to the Drusen. And then uh, this is uh, preliminary data, a small case series comparing eyes with early AMD to intermediate AMD. Uh, we see uh, an increase in the area of the hyperreflective foci. Uh, although there's a large variance uh, in the data set, uh, we can also examine uh, features which are uh, more uh, elevated, close to the inner plexiform layer. Uh, versus uh, close uh, to uh, Brooks membrane. So there's actually a large uh, inhomogeneity uh, in uh, these features. And I think one of the challenges is we can assess them in a volume, but we need to really understand the relationship uh, to, uh, to disease stage and also to progression. Uh, by using volumes, it's possible to do longitudinal uh, studies. Uh, this is a, a follow-up uh, at 11 months, uh, comparing two volumes which have been registered, and we can actually see the motion uh, of the hyperreflective features as well as uh, the enlargement or collapse of Drusen. So there's potential for having a lot of data uh, in these types of volumes, and again, the challenge is to uh, quantify them and to relate them to disease. Okay, so this is the first part of the presentation on the high resolution uh, OCT. Uh, the second part, I'd like to uh, emphasize ultra high speed. Uh, in this case, uh, we can uh, image at 400 to 600 kilohertz axial scan rates, uh, which are much faster uh, than the commercial systems. This is a prototype instrument. And with these types of speeds, it's possible to do quantitative OCT angiography. Okay, so this shows the system, uh, which is uh, prototype schematic, uh, 600 kilohertz scan rate, seven micron axial resolution. With a high speed, of course, we can do wide field structural and OCT angiographic imaging, but for OCT angiography, we can do multiple A scans, uh, I'm sorry, B scans, uh, with very short time between the scans, short inner scan time. This allows us to do variable inter scan time analysis. Uh, we can do fine A-scan spacing, which is necessary to resolve connectivity on the capillary level. 
And then finally, with these techniques, we can do a next generation variable interscan time analysis, which can extract a quantitative marker for blood flow speeds on the capillary level. Okay, so the question then is how, how can we do this? Uh, the relationship of blood flow speed uh, to interscan time in OCTN geography has been investigated, uh, and we see that uh, if we have uh, increasing time between scans, then the OCT signal increases, but then saturates. Faster blood flows will saturate sooner, so this is a measure of speed. And that's the basic idea for extracting the quantitative marker. So in this case, we perform multiple uh, scans, B scans, and then we can compare different times between the scans, uh, between sequential scans versus every second scan or every third scan. This gives us a range of interscan times, and then we can quantify how fast uh, the OCT signal uh, will saturate. So this is actually used in neurosciences uh, to quantify uh, blood flow in the brain in small animal models. The concept is, uh, if we imagine uh, looking at traffic, if we have slow traffic and we look at different time intervals, we see that there's not very much change. But if the uh, traffic moves quickly, then we see a rapid change or decorrelation between sequential observations. So this is similar uh, to what we're doing uh, with OCTN geography. Uh, the decorrelation uh, is a measure of uh, the flow. Okay, so we can do sequential measurements um, with the multiple scans, and then we can fit this uh, to an exponential model. Uh, this exponential parameter alpha is a surrogate marker for blood flow. So by measuring uh, this correlation, uh, we have a measure of uh, the blood flow. It's not a direct measurement, uh, but it correlates uh, with the blood flow speed. Okay, so then the next problem is uh, these measurements are inherently very noisy, so we need to average or compound the images over regions. Adaptive optics has shown that capillary segments have relatively constant flows, so if we can identify the capillary segments, uh, then we can uh, average over these segments. Okay, so this is the concept. We can look at enlargements of the capillary segments, identify them, and then uh, extract the uh, decorrelation parameter over each capillary segment. And this assigns a uh, flow speed to each capillary segment, which you see here. And then finally, this can be represented in the false color image, superimposing on the standard OCT angiogram. Okay, so. Uh, using this technique, uh, we can also resolve variations from the cardiac cycle, cardiac pulsatility, which you see here, and this can be compensated, at least partially. Okay, so uh, if we look at the normal retina, uh, we can see uh, differences in uh, the capillary plexi, the uh, RNFL versus uh, superficial and intermediate versus the deep capillary plexus. And uh, we see uh, slower flow in general in the deep capillary plexus, uh, which has been expected from uh, other studies. We can look at diabetic retinopathy in mild NPDR. Uh, we see uh, decreases in flow uh, in the superficial capillary plexus. In severe NPDR, we start to see inhomogeneities, which are likely due to capillary dropout and shunting effects. We can look at uh, vascular abnormalities. We see this in homogeneity in flow speeds on the capillary level here. And we can also look at features such as looping and microaneurysms. It's also possible to investigate the choriocapillaris, uh, which we see with normal OCT angiography. We can identify uh, the lobular structure and also potentially the feeding and draining of vasculature, uh, which you see with the arrows. And then uh, by uh, extracting uh, the flow speed, we can see the variations in flow uh, speed, uh, increased uh, speed in the area of uh, feeding and draining vasculature. Uh, here we see enlargements, and then we can section deeper uh, slightly below the query capillaris, which picks up uh, the feeding and draining vessels, and we see increased flow uh, in these regions, which is consistent with what you would expect from fluid dynamics models. 
Uh, we also see changes in the corycapillaris uh, associated with diabetic retinopathy. So I think potentially this type of uh, method can, can be used to assess flow impairment, which may be an early marker preceding capillary non-perfusion. Okay, so again, uh, we discussed uh, high resolution, uh, different methods to resolve fine structure, uh, as well as volumetric techniques uh, to uh, assess focal pathology. Ultra high speed uh, allows us to do OCT angiography and to develop techniques uh, which can uh, have a surrogate marker for capillary blood flow speeds uh, on, on uh, the capillary level. So I think this gives a sense for the potential uh, for uh, current and next generation OCT applications. Thank you very much for your attention.